Our last presentation for this session will be by John Garanson. Oh, that's a horrible okay, pronunciation. Sorry if I <laughs> Swedish nurse currently working with MSF in Erbit, Jordan, on a third mission with MSF, bachelor's degree in nursing from Red Cross University College of Stockholm. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. So um, what I'm going to say here is much linking on to what Filippa already is talking about. So we're talking about meeting the health needs of Syrian refugees in Jordan and the novel model of non-communicable disease care that we have implemented in this setting. So a lot of the background will be a bit addressed. So there's around 600,000 Syrian refugees in Jordan, and most of them are living in the northern parts. And you already addressed for what the impact of NCDs in this group. What we haven't really touched base is that most of these diseases are not infectious. They're caused by mostly lifestyle. They're caused by obesity, smoking, and inactive lifestyle. And in Syria, uh, a third of all women are obese, and a fifth of all men are obese. 60% um, of all men is smoking. Uh, it's an epidemic. Um, and by actually targeting these areas, we can actually prevent stroke, heart disease, and diabetes type 2, up to 80%. So the objective of this study is to explore the novel model of NCD care and its early clinical outcomes. We're also exploring the feasibility of using motivational interviewing on lifestyle change in Syrian refugees, and also its early outcomes. We've used a retrospective uh, um, descriptive study. To be part of the study, we picked the first 400 diabetes type 2 and hypertensive patients. We've also uh, routine, uh, analyzed routinely collected data and analyzed it with the paired t-test. So the intervention is, of course, the, the most uh, interesting part of this. So since the 15th of December, we've been operational. Uh, not a very long time. Um, we are working together with the Ministry of Health. Um, in addition to diabetes type 2 and hypertension that, we do, that we're looking at in this study, we're also including uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, and of course diabetes type 1. Here on the right you have our patient circuit, and our model of care is its nice because we be able to provide a lot of face time with the healthcare prof professional. Uh, we're actually providing 30 minutes of the first initial doctor visit, 30 minutes with the patient, and additional in the uh, health counseling, additional 30 minutes. So they see a healthcare, uh, healthcare professional for more than one hour. Um, we also have implemented the, the appointment system, because I actually visited Lebanon in November and heard about their problem with defaulters. So we can actually report that we have very low defaulter rates. 2.5% of our patients are completely lost to follow-up, an additional 25 around are um, voluntary exiting, mostly because of moving back to Syria. But if we're talking about our patient court in total, so we're looking at treating currently 1,600 patients after only four and a half months. 50% of them have more than one condition, 64% of them have uh, diabetes type 2, an additional 54% uh, has hypertension. And it's really complex uh, this, uh, cohort. Uh, staggering 60% of our patients are obese, 60%, which means they have a BMI over 30. But this is the common to the innovating part. I think change is difficult, and I think that many people in this room would like to change something in their lives. I know I want to. Uh, and a way of approaching ambivalence toward change is motivational interviewing. It's a patient-centered coaching style that instead of imposing change on somebody, it looks at ambivalence and let the patients their own um, examine uh, the individual process. We're working with creating, the coaches are creating an environment of mutual trust and trying to support the patient in this process. Uh, we're using techniques that are called the ORs, uh, open questions, affirmations, um, reflections, and helping the patient by summarizing what they've actually said. So it's the patient talking, not the coach. After a while, on the, on the, on the left side here, we see different stages of change, which the patient is constantly moving through. 
uh, when after a while we always hear a patient starting saying, I want, I would like, I should. This is where a patient's moving into a preparation phase from maybe starting pondering over, uh, over change and then moving into uh, actually trying to do it. And here we support the patient by creating their own change plan, a concrete, smart plan that is supposed to be achievable. So why did we choose this style? We, we chose it because it's a, um, it's a proven to be effective in terms of reducing BMI, body mass index. It's uh, been um, proven to uh, help with long-term smoking cessation and also increasing physical activity. But here comes, how we adapted this to the context. Um, it's not, there's not a lot of research on MI in refugee contexts. Um, and what we have faced that we had to include treatment care supporters and family members a lot more in the sessions. Um, the, for example, an old man wanting to change his um, dietary habits. It's not, we're not going to be able to reach him if he doesn't reach his wife, because his wife is the one taking the decisions at home when it comes to nutrition. So we had to ha include a lot more. Um, in terms of human resources and training, uh, all our coaches are nurses, uh, trained, have an introduction basic training in the motivational interviewing, and we're focusing most on the spirit of MI. And I'm going to address the challenges a bit later. So. We're coming to the results, and it's, as I say, very preliminary results, a short uh, time period. I want to look at the upper line, which is systolic blood pressure, um, which is the most important factor when it comes to reducing mortality and mobility. We've actually had a significant drop from 144 to 136 uh, in systolic blood pressure which we can easily say we have taken our first 237 hypertensive patients from having uncontrolled hypertension to having controlled hypertension, which is quite an achievement in only four months. Looking at our HbA1c's results, once again, very preliminary data. So we've seen that uh, we've had a significant drop. So for HbA1c is a long-term blood sugar test in the blood for diabetes patients. The cutoff point where we want to be under is seven, Quite not here, we'll be going in the right direction. And we will hopefully, this is only 84 patients, but we're hoping to provide uh, better data soon. Here, stage of change. We're actually using it as a diagnostic tool. Uh, our coaches are diagnosing the patients and where in this cycle they are. And we can see that we're looking from the slide from the left to the right. So we're looking at in the beginning, 66% 6 of all our patients wasn't even thinking about changing their life. And after, a couple of uh, months, uh, we see that patients are starting to thinking about it, starting actually preparing to change, and actually changing, changing making changes in their daily life. The tricky part is, of course, maintaining this change, and it's way too early to come with any big conclusions. And I'm saying here, uh, last visit. Uh, last visit is because many of our patients have had different numbers of follow-up visits. Some have had three, some have had five, all depending on the complexity of their disease. Quickly going over uh, lifestyle results. So we have not had any body mass index uh, significant changes yet. It's way too early and a lot of different confounders. We have uh, we've looked at the patients that are actually in action phase in, in, in the lifestyle change, and we see that 38% of them are decreasing their smoking habit, and 6% of them are stopping smoking right now. Comes to physical activity level, we see that 28% of our patients are becoming more active, and we're using the uh, general practice uh, physical activity questionnaire and diagnosing the, diff the, the, the different levels. Uh, we, of course, face challenges. We saw that we, many of our patients have a lower understanding on their disease process than we thought. Uh, and we had to start by talking about disease process, risk, and complications before we can move into um, uh, the actual lifestyle change. We have identified a lot of barriers towards change. Stress and trauma. Many of our patients are coming with very traumatic, exp uh, traumatic experience behind them. And, and many of them have families left in Syria, which is, of course, not a good foundation for change. Um, many of our patients say, I'm not going to change here. I'm going to change when I come back to Syria. 
Unemployment is illegal for refugees to work in, in Jordan, uh, which is of course linked to the financial situation. Support from WFP and UNHCR is decreasing, and limited funds is not a um, good foundation to make, um, let's say, healthy choices in terms of diet, and doesn't help with when nicotine substitute is three times the price than the actual cigarettes. Um, I'm gonna go quickly also to, to culture. So in terms of physical activity is not really built into the, the culture. Most of our patients are coming from southern Syria, Dada region. Um, women are not always acceptable walking outside. So we're trying to find even in, in innovating ways of addressing this. A lot of limitations to the project are also links into limitations to the study. It's a new content in the setting. Uh, we're in startup phase. We're trying to set all the different systems in place. Short time perspective, uh, we already addressed the non-consistent follow-up duration. Staff has only had basic training, and the more time that, that goes, the more experience they get, and the higher the quality of uh, motivational interviewing we can provide. We also had some changes in patient file that could have implicated some of the uh, data collection. Conclusions, so what can we say? We can say that a patient-centered model of care for NCDs appears to be feasible uh, in a refugee context, and its early clinical outcomes looks promising. We can also say that motivational interviewing towards lifestyle chains uh, seems to be feasible and actually seems to improve motivation at this early point. We can also say that Syrian refugees are struggling with barriers towards chains, and we have to find ways of addressing these barriers and, and taking them on. Come to the future, so we hope to provide a formal evaluation uh, to be able to inform other NCD projects in similar settings. I'm saying similar settings, because Jordan and Lebanon are very, quite different settings that we normally uh, work in. Hopefully also to provide outcome indicators and together work uh, for a data tool, I would say, for OCA. Uh, we're also focusing on trying to get health counseling guidelines for non clinical disease care, which is non-existent right now in, in our programs. A lot of people, as you can see, as we're working together with me, I will now say a special thank you to Dr. Lars Failing, who started this project with me last year. Um, and the biggest thank you go to Dr. Rami Sugul, who is the man uh, working on the data. And without him, none of this would have been possible. Thank you very much. And let's open up for some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, your question, please. The technical questions. Um, I'm Misha, working with the MSF Unit 8 pool. I just had a question, because I assume that smoking activity is, is uh, activity, activities is self-reported. Yes. Um, how did you control for desirability bias? <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this. Of right. course. Uh, that bias always, always exists, because uh, it is self-reported, and same with physical activity level. Uh, so we're trying to develop um, an environment of trust with our patients in our sessions. And they do come back regularly uh, for every follow-up uh, follow session is 15 minutes. So they get to see uh, these patients through a long period of time and actually develops a relationship. But of course, that bias always exists when it comes to self-reported uh, tools. I, I wish I could say that we, we had a magical way of, of not having that bias. Gentlemen here. Daniel O'Brien, I'm just wondering in your smoking cessation, do you use nicotine replacement like patches? Um, because it'll be quite, I haven't seen that used in MSF before. Yeah, so nicotine substitute we are not using. MSF is not providing this. Uh, of course, that would be a I think, big debate in MSF. We're starting to do that. Uh, but it is proven that 50 to 70 percent of our patients, our patients are helped with nicotine substitute. And of course, that would be an added effect. But at this point, we do not do that. Uh, it's something that we're trying to discuss, of at least maybe targeting nicotine substitute to the patients that are in action phase and prepar preparation phase, but not to everybody, but to the ones who actually want to change that we can follow up. Because they are three times more expensive than actual cigarettes. Another question, please? Yes, please. 
Oh, hi there. Um, my name is Maeve. I'm from New Zealand, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of like the obesity part of your study, um, did you involve the use of a dietitian at all, or did you consider that? Because I guess in a lot of other studies like this, there's a lot of intensive kind of you know dietary change, and I was also wondering. I, I presume that the Syrian refugees status makes also maybe food security an issue and mm -hmm. accessibility? So our program is set up in that uh, nurses are the coaches, but they are technically supervised by a dietitian who is hired as a health promoter, who has given them and me training in, in how to eat properly. Uh, but as you said, there's a lot of barriers. Uh, WFP food rations have been cut by half since November, and that makes it very difficult for, for patients to have enough money to actually make sound dietary choices. Yeah. But we have a dietitian involved, yes. Last question, please. Hi, I'm Anna from Institute Pasteur. Um, I'm just wondering, did you do any separation of looking at the time since seeking refuge or the time since arriving in the patients that you're looking at and what their motivational levels were or separating that, those groups out, stratification type? We have not done, done that yet. So we, we are looking at routinely collected data and we, we have their, uh, no, we don't actually look at their uh, arrival date into Jordan. Um, that would be something interesting looking at, maybe for the future. Okay. Um, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Please join yes. us here. I would like to um, invite the panelists to come here.